two recent health scares involving older members of Congress are raising questions again about imposing age limits. Yeah, just say aye. Okay, just aye. aye. And a string of uh, Our politicians are old. So are our Supreme Court justices. At least a fifth of our Congress is past retirement age. Mitch McConnell keeps freezing during his own press conferences, Dianne Feinstein clung to receipt despite being incapable of doing her job, and every vacancy on the Supreme Court is unexpected and rare, which opens up such a huge political spectacle that it halts the functioning of the entire rest of our government. This has all led to increased calls for setting term limits for our highest court and our Congress people. But term limits might have unintended consequences, and I think there's a better way forward. This this is why you're wrong about term limits. Roll the intro. My perfect angel daughter Moira and I would like to thank my partner on today's video, Sundays. Most healthy dog foods are frankly an expensive, frozen mess. And I don't know if you've ever met a bulldog before, but being goopy is not something they need help with. So adding goopy foods to the mix is really not it. I've tried it. Sundays is dog food that works with your life. No defrosting, no prep, no cleanup, just healthy and easy. Sundays is 100% human grade and uses only real food ingredients that you can recognize, pronounce, and probably even eat yourself. It's not kibble, pre-cooked or frozen, it's gently air-dried to preserve nutrition and flavor. It was founded by veterinarian Dr. Tori Waxman because she couldn't find a dog food that was as nutritious as home-cooked meals or as convenient as dry food. So over three years and over 17 formulations, she made it herself. And we love that. And Moira loves Sundays. I get that starting your pup on a new food is a big deal, which is why Sundays offers samples. This gives your pup a chance to try Sundays and fall in love, and you just pay shipping and handling. And then when you're ready, Sundays has an extra extra special Black Friday deal happening right now. It's their biggest discount they've ever offered. Click the link in the description to get 60% off your first order of Sundays, now through November 30th. That's a good deal, all right? Act fast. Thanks, Sundays. In this video, I'm gonna lay out the current state of our Congress and Supreme Court, what we've tried to do in the past to change this and why it's always failed, the pros and cons of term limits, alternative and better options, and finally, what would really work to reform our democracy in a constructive way, hint, it's not term limits. Back in 1995, venerated judge and legal scholar Richard Posner called the federal judiciary the nation's premier geriatric occupation. And that was in 1995. Today, it's only gotten worse in both the judiciary and in Congress. Let's start with the Supreme Court. Supreme Court justices serve a lifetime position on the court and leave only because they choose to retire or because the icy grip of death finally takes them. Because of Trump's judicial appointments, today's court is actually relatively young, with only two justices justices over the age of 70 and four justices in their 50s. Before the Trump presidency in 2016, only Elena Kagan was under 60, with four justices in their 70s and 80s. Longer life expectancy has helped create an aging court. From 1789 to 1820, the average age of justices leaving the court, either by retirement or death, was 58. If that were still the case, only four of the current justices would still be on the bench. Today, the average age of those leaving the bench is 80. In addition, the increased prestige of the job of Supreme Court justice is very different from the founding of this country. When the Supreme Court was first invented, very few people really wanted to be a justice, and justices had to travel to various towns throughout the Union to hear cases which involved long, grueling, muddy journeys in horse-drawn carriages in all types of weather. Today, it's the ultimate achievement a lawyer could ever attain. These two facts, longer life expectancy and greater job prestige, have changed the nature of what it means to be a Supreme Court justice. The infrequency of vacancy means that when a justice does leave the bench, there is enormous political pressure to get get the vacancy filled by the right person, depending on which side of the political spectrum the president happens to be on at that time. It also means greater pressure on the justices themselves to jockey for political gain for their perceived party, even though justices are, of course, unbiased and unswayed by current events. 
picture. For example, many have placed blame on Ruth Bader Ginsburg for not just retiring when Obama was in the White House so that he could have replaced her instead of waiting until when she died and Trump was president, which, first of all, affords RBG with far more psychic powers than she probably had as a regular human, and second of all, would undermine the whole idea that the Founding Fathers had about keeping the judiciary insulated from the politics of the day. That was the whole point behind lifetime tenure for Supreme Court justices. The idea was that if they didn't have to worry about re-election or who was in office, they could make unbiased judicial decisions. And for the Founding Fathers, living past 60 was incredibly rare in 1787. This also meant that it was incredibly rare to live to an age where you were past your mental prime. People in the 1700s were dropping dead from the common flu, not from Alzheimer's. And that's simply not the reality that we're living in today in 2023, where lifetime tenure on the highest court of the land has resulted in rarer Supreme Court nominations, greater fights over said nominations, and a judiciary that is increasingly older and more out of touch with changing times. Since George Washington, the average number of Supreme Court appointments that a president can expect to receive is 2.6, with a number of presidents appointing five or more justices prior to 1980. But since Reagan, no president has appointed more than two Supreme Court justices except Trump. That scarcity, caused by increasing life expectancy of justices, means that when there's a vacancy for a Supreme Court justice, there's a fight. Whether it's fights over two different justices credibly accused of assault, or a bitter fight that denied Obama a nomination during the last year of his presidency. And because of this, especially in the wake of the death of RBG a few years ago, there's been increased calls for term limits for our Supreme Court justices. And recent events have also increased calls for term limits for our representatives as well. Human turd Mitch McConnell has had two separate incidents in which he fully froze on camera during his own press conferences. Dianne Feinstein held onto her seat until her death despite declining health that kept her from doing her job effectively for months. Biden is the oldest president we've ever had and will likely run against the second oldest president we've ever had in the next year's election unless he goes to prison. The most powerful people in Congress are octogenarians Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi. The median age of senators is 65, literally retirement age. These people are old as dirt, y'all, and they're setting policies that will affect us years, if not decades, after their death. And beyond just the threat of declining physical and mental capacity, an aging Congress is one of the many reasons why it often feels that the actions they take are incredibly out of step with what the majority of Americans want. And people are getting fed up with watching their country be run by people who are literally on death's doorstep. 87% of adults favor term limits for members of Congress. Only 12% are actively opposed to it. It's one of the few things we can agree on across partisan lines. And yet, when you look at the outcomes that term limits would create, for Congress or for the Supreme Court, I think the majority of Americans are wrong on this one. Sorry. There have been numerous attempts to impose term limits on both Supreme Court justices and on Congress people. Let's start with the Supreme Court. Calls for term limits on Supreme Court nominees first gained traction in 1987 when Lewis F. Powell, our friend who wrote the infamous Powell memo, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, he retired and Reagan nominated a man named Robert Bork. We've talked about Bork as well. Remember the Saturday Night Massacre from my Watergate video? At the height of the Watergate investigation, Nixon ordered his attorney general, Elliot Richardson, to fire the special prosecutor investigating the case. Richardson refused and resigned. Nixon then ordered the deputy attorney general, William Ruckelshaus, to fire the special prosecutor. He also refused and resigned, which left none other than our friend Robert Bork as acting attorney general. And when Nixon ordered him to fire the the special prosecutor, Bork complied. He later went on to become a circuit judge so that by the time Reagan came around, Bork's name came up as a potential nominee for the Supreme Court. The problem was that not only had he participated in one of the largest scandals to ever come out of the White House, he also was really in favor of amassing power into the hands of the president, much like Project 2025 out of the Heritage Foundation this year, which we also talked about in a past video. It's all connected, people. Anyway, that made people nervous. He also thought that the federal government didn't have the right to impose voting fairness laws on the states, and he supported poll taxes. And he didn't agree that there existed a right of privacy in the 14th Amendment, meaning he would have been opposed to constitutionally protected rights to abortion, at least at the time, contraception, and even interracial marriages. Honestly, this guy was ahead of his time. He would have fit right in with the far-right extremists in our government now. And after an incredibly successful and sometimes inaccurate smear campaign by Democrats and organizations against Robert Bork, the Senate denied Bork's confirmation. To again give you an idea of how old our government representatives are, Joe Biden sat on the Senate Judiciary Committee that denied Bork's confirmation. This was almost 40 years ago. Biden literally has more hair now than he did then. Hair plugs, frankly a miraculous invention. 
How do they do that? Okay, so all that to say that the kerfuffle over Bork's nomination brought discussion of the idea of term limits for Supreme Court justices to a national scale, in the hope that term limits would lead to more regular and predictable replacement of Supreme Court justices with newer ones, making the judicial nomination process less divisive and disruptive, restoring confidence in the confirmation process and in the Supreme Court generally. The push for term limits was drowned out, however, in the years following Bork's failed nomination, when there were six new justices appointed over eight years. That level of turnover made term limits more of a moot point. But then, in 1994, Stephen Breyer joined the bench, and there were no new vacancies in the court for over a decade. This culminated in 2006 with a major proposal led by Northwestern University law professors and published in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy to introduce term limits into the Supreme Court. They argued in favor of staggered 18-year terms so that a vacancy would occur every two years on non-election years, giving each president two appointments per term. They also analyzed whether these term limits could be imposed by a new law from Congress, and found that the only way forward that wouldn't be potentially overturned later by the very court it attempted to regulate would be via a constitutional amendment. They argued 18-year terms would reduce the average tenure, which since 1970 has hovered around 25 years, and the reform would also likely lead to reduced retirement age, since most justices are appointed when they're in their mid-50s and would thus retire before 80 in most cases, removing the danger of unexpected death while in office or mental decline. This plan, the authors argued would reduce the stakes of the nomination process and make the court more democratically accountable and legitimate by providing for regular updating of the court's membership, making the court more accountable in theory to the will of the people. This idea of term limits for Supreme Court justices was revived again with the death of RBG and the incredibly conservative turn of the current court, which frequently is out of line with what the majority of Americans want. Alongside calls for term limits for Supreme Court justices have been many calls, often from the right, for term limits for Congress people. Back in 1994, Newt Gingrich, then the minority minority whip of the House of Representatives, led Republicans in a push during the midterm elections to win back seats in Congress by promising the implementation of the Contract with America. Remember, we've talked about that too. It's all connected. Term limits for Congress people were also a part of the contract with America. The reason why Republicans pushed for term limits is because by the mid-1990s, the Republicans had been won out by Democrats for decades, and they believed that the advantages that Democratic incumbents had were denying them, the Republicans, their rightful majorities in Congress. The contract with America is credited with winning landslide victories for Republicans in the 1994 midterm elections, flipping both the Senate and the House to Republicans for the first time since 1953. Once that happened, Republicans fervor for term limits died out, because it was mainly motivated by getting more power, and then they got that power. That, combined with a lawsuit in 1995, put the idea to bed seemingly for good. At that time, Arkansas was denying the ability for their own congressional representatives to appear on any ballots in the state if they had already served three terms for representatives and two terms for senators, effectively enforcing term limits, at least for their own congresspeople. In U.S. Term Limits, Inc. v. Thornton, the Supreme Court decided that this was unconstitutional, saying the framers could have created term limits, but chose not to, indicating that they never intended for there to be term limits, and therefore making it unconstitutional to deny lawmakers the ability to run for as many terms as they wanted. This was a 5-4 decision, with Justice John Paul Stevens writing from the majority, saying, "...such a state-imposed restriction is contrary to the fundamental principle of our representative democracy, embodied in the Constitution, that the people should choose whom they please to govern them." Because of this, advocates for the imposition of term limits have pushed for a constitutional amendment, the only way to get around the court's ruling that the Constitution doesn't allow for term limits. Proponents of term limits have generally advocated for the same limits that Arkansas tried to impose. Two terms for senators, a total of 12 years, and three terms for representatives, a total of six years. Donald Trump, as candidate, revived calls for term limits, saying that they would help him drain the swamp. And this appears to be something that has been popular among Americans, and even among lawmakers, for decades. In fact, legislation that would add a term limit amendment to the Constitution has been introduced in nearly every congressional session since 1943. And that legislation has clearly never been successful. To understand why, we need to lay out the arguments for and against term limits and why the cons might just outweigh the pros. So let's do a pros-cons list for term limits, both for the Supreme Court and for congressional representatives. Let's start with the pros. Pros for implementing term limits for the Supreme Court. Reduced divisiveness in judicial nominations. Term limits could make the judicial nomination process less divisive by adding predictability to when changes in the Supreme Court occur, potentially restoring confidence in the confirmation process. Reflecting contemporary realities. Term limits for justices might make the Supreme Court more responsive to current societal needs and values, as opposed to being reflective of past political fights. Democratic accountability. 
Term limits could make the Supreme Court's ideological direction more democratically accountable, as opposed to hinging on the health and longevity of justices. Political campaign focus. Term limits would likely make the Supreme Court a standard issue in presidential and Senate campaigns, thus reducing its status as a political football game during nominations. Avoiding age-based nominations. They would remove the incentive to nominate only young justices who could serve for extended periods, thus diversifying the age range of justices. Here are the pros in favor of implementing term limits for Congress members relief for lawmakers. For Congress, term limits would free lawmakers from the burden of constant fundraising, allowing them to focus more on policymaking and less on re-election pressures. Fresh perspectives. New members of Congress brought in through term limits would bring fresh ideas and approaches, potentially improving Congress's effectiveness and public perception. Inoculation against corruption. Limiting the time that elected officials can spend in power might be the best way to prevent the corrosive practices of Washington from affecting well-intentioned lawmakers. Prevention of power concentration. Drawing a parallel to presidential term limits, advocates argue that too much power should never be concentrated in the hands of a few individuals for extended periods. Public opinion on congressional effectiveness. There is a perception that new individuals might be more effective than career politicians. And this all sounds pretty good. More accountability, less corruption, less obsession with re-election, at least for those who know they're on their last term, regular turnover of fresh ideas in Congress, certainly much more opportunity for younger people to get involved, and more. But Let's turn to the cons, because frankly, once I was presented with the cons, it really gave me pause about the idea of term limits, so let's lay them out. First, here are the drawbacks of imposing term limits on Supreme Court justices, specifically looking at the proposal to limit them to staggered 18-year terms. Potential for increased politicization. Staggered term limits could exacerbate the politicization of the confirmation process, especially in scenarios of divided government, where one party could block nominations, leading to an imbalanced court. We saw it happen when Obama was robbed of his opportunity to nominate a Supreme Court justice because of roadblocks put in place by a highly politicized Senate. Term limits would not protect against this possibility. No significant change in court composition. Historical analysis suggests that term limits would not actually have significantly altered the ideological composition of the Supreme Court over time. Transition challenges. Implementing term limits would create a transition period with some justices serving different term lengths, leading to potential inconsistencies and complexities. Current justices would continue their lifetime tenure, creating the need for interim justices and an awkward transition period. Questions of legitimacy and influence. Long terms, like 18 years, would still keep the stakes high in confirmation battles, which doesn't help assuage concerns about legitimacy and susceptibility to special interests. Basically, imposing term limits for justices, while likely contrary to the Constitution, would also create a lot of headache to implement, while also not likely creating the change that people are looking for, i.e. less politicization of the confirmation process and a court that actually reflects the will of the people. Studies have shown that's not a likely outcome. And the list of cons for term limits on Congress people is even longer. Anti-democratic nature. Term limits take away voter choice, particularly when constituents are satisfied with their representatives. As a progressive, I think about this in terms of AOC and Bernie Sanders. Before becoming a senator, Sanders was a U.S. representative from 1991 to 2007. He's been a senator since 2007. Term limits would mean that had he served consecutively in the House, and run out of his time, and then in the Senate, and run out of his time, term limits wise, starting in 1991, he would have reached his term limits and been forced out of office by 2009, despite the fact that Vermonters have been democratically voting him in over and over again for decades at this point. AOC started her term in the House in 2019, meaning that in two years at the age of 36, she would be barred from ever serving in the House again. If she went straight into serving on the Senate from there, she'd be barred from serving in Congress altogether by 48 years old, even if her constituents fervently supported her. Loss of expertise and experience. Term limits could prevent members of Congress from gaining deep policy policy expertise, and institutional knowledge, which are crucial for effective legislating. Impediment to relationship building. Term limits would hinder the development of long-term cross-party relationships and relationships with key stakeholders, essential for the creation of legislation. Power shift to staff and agencies. With less experienced lawmakers, unelected staff, bureaucrats, government agencies, and lobbyists would likely gain disproportionate influence in policymaking. This is because newer politicians would turn to those who do have institutional knowledge for support in creating policy, and ousting experienced elected politicians creates a vacuum of knowledge that lobbyists and other special interest groups could easily fill. As we discussed in my video on lobbying, this is something that's already happening because Congress is understaffed and must rely on lobbyists to create reports and feed them information that they need to make decisions and draft policies. This would only get worse if we removed all the elected officials who have deep institutional knowledge 
privilege and would concentrate more power in the hands of unelected people who have no accountability. Reduced incentive for policy expertise. Knowing that their time is limited, members might not invest in developing deep expertise on complex issues or spearheading major legislation, which takes years to implement. Removal of effective lawmakers. Term limits would arbitrarily force out skilled and popular legislators regardless of their performance. Exacerbation of revolving door issues. Term limits would likely increase the prevalence of former lawmakers turning to lobbying, intensifying the revolving door between Congress and the private sector, because what else are they going to do? Weakening of the legislative branch. Term limits could weaken Congress relative to other government players because of this loss of institutional knowledge and relationship building power that longer term Congress people can grow over years. Inadequate solution for corruption and competition. Studies suggest that term limits do not effectively address issues of corruption or political competition. Look at the presidency. The damage Donald Trump did in four years, especially to our judiciary, will last decades. And presidential campaigns continue to dominate headlines and cost billions of dollars to finance, even with two term limits. Undermining voter rights. Instituting term limits could be seen as a violation of voters' rights to choose their preferred representatives. This is less of a concern with the presidency because of the overriding fear of putting too much power in one executive for long periods of time, which is less of a concern for Congress people serving as an elective legislative body. Though the framers of the Constitution didn't implement term limits for anyone, including the president. That didn't happen until the ratification of the 22nd Amendment in 1951. Difficulty of implementation. A final con for term limits for both the Supreme Court and Congress is that it is generally agreed that it would require the passage of a constitutional amendment. The 22nd Amendment was only successful because FDR broke the long-held tradition of two-term presidents being elected to an unprecedented four terms and then dying in office 82 days after his fourth inauguration. That unrest and break with long-standing precedent was enough to push the country to amend the Constitution. Unlikely that that level of fervor for term limits would effectively pass an amendment today, especially given the list of cons I just laid out for you and the increased polarization in this country that leads me to believe that the level of consensus necessary for a constitutional amendment is nearly impossible here today. It hasn't been done in three decades. As a reminder, to pass a constitutional amendment requires two-thirds of both houses of Congress to approve it, then it's sent to the states where it must be ratified by three-fourths of the states. There is a second way amendments can happen, by a two-thirds vote in the Senate and then three-fourths of conventions held in each state for ratification, but that method's never been used. Either way, this level of consensus seems entirely out of reach in the current setup of this country. Not to be a Debbie Downer, or as one recent commenter called me, a whiny little bitch. <laughs> okay, but all this is not to say that there is absolutely no hope for placing limits on the length of time that Supreme Court justices and Congress people serve. Instead of term limits, many have called for decades for mandatory retirement ages for justices and Congress people alike. The closest Congress came to addressing the issue was in 1954, when a large Senate majority approved a constitutional amendment that would have forced all federal judges to retire at 75. However, a few days later, the Supreme Court announced its ruling in Brown v. Board of Education, and the nation's attention shifted to the fight over desegregation, forgetting the retirement age argument altogether. It wasn't forgotten in the states, however. Currently, Rhode Island is the only state that doesn't impose term limits or mandatory retirement ages on its Supreme Court justices. A federal mandatory retirement age of, say, 75 has many benefits. Much like limited terms, a mandatory retirement age could introduce predictability and stability into the appointment and retirement process, making it less susceptible to sudden and unpredictable vacancies due to health issues or death. It would also help ensure that members of the judiciary and Congress are serving at a capacity not not significantly diminished by age-related decline. A mandatory retirement age is nonpartisan and isn't left to the whims of whoever's in power at the moment. In fact, it is almost as popular as term limits among the American public, with 79% in favor of age limits for elected officials and 74% in favor of age limits for Supreme Court justices. Mandatory retirement ages are preferable to term limits because they aren't based on length of service and are more based on the quality of service that someone in their later years is able to give. Mandatory retirement also allows for experienced and competent competent elected officials to serve as long as people are willing to re-elect them up to the set retirement age. This also aligns with other professions, such as commercial pilots and military personnel who have mandatory retirement agents. And it creates a balance between our concern for the public's ability to freely elect who they wish, while also ensuring the mental acuity of Congress people and justices. There are, of course, some downsides to the idea of mandatory retirement ages. Picking an age would necessarily be arbitrary, as there's not a real way to determine when the average lawmaker's mental capacities start going downhill such that they 
they shouldn't be serving in office anymore. Some argue that a retirement age limit would push presidents to appoint ever younger Supreme Court justices to ensure they're on the bench for as long as possible. This honestly seems less plausible given that there is at least a semblance of precedent for appointing judges with decades of legal experience, usually as judges on lower courts, which just requires time to attain that career level. So it would be hard to justify to the Senate Judiciary Committee why a 35 year old with less than a decade of legal experience is qualified to sit on the highest court in the country. And then of course, there is also the downside that implementation would be a long headache. There would likely be political resistance given what we've already talked about regarding the age of our current lawmakers, many of whom would have to vote in favor of a retirement age that is younger than they are, plus the political consensus that would have to arise once again to pass an amendment to the constitution, which would still be required in a retirement age scenario. Many also cry ageism when the idea of mandatory retirement is announced. But again, mandatory retirement ages aren't unprecedented when weighed against the importance of the role of a congressperson or Supreme Court justice, similarly to commercial pilots and military personnel. I don't want my plane flown by an 85 year old and I don't want my government run by one either. Not only is it not unprecedented within the United States, mandatory retirement ages are actually the norm around the world. No other major Western democracy, nor the majority of US states, allows its most powerful judges to serve so late into their lives. Canada adopted the mandatory retirement age of 75 for Supreme Court justices back in 1927. Australia established a retirement age of 70 for high court justices in 1977 after the 46 year tenure of Justice Edward McTiernan, who was appointed in 1930 and by the 1970s was barely coherent when speaking from the bench during oral arguments. The man was so old he broke his hip while attempting to swat at a cricket with a rolled up newspaper, after which he retired and parliament quickly took up the issue of establishing a retirement age with little opposition. Canada also has a mandatory retirement age of 75 for its senators, as do many European countries like the Netherlands and Norway. As Harvard law professor and legal historian Mark Tushnet has said, everybody who's thought about designing a constitutional court since 1900 has thought that a retirement age was a good thing. There's no reason to think that they were wrong. The existence of tenure until death or choice is extremely rare around the world. One reason for this is because other Western democracies have been able to change their constitutions to match public sentiment and the changing times where life expectancies are far longer than they were 200 years ago. This is because the US constitution is notoriously difficult to amend. Of the 31 democracies examined by the political theorist Donald Lutz in his comparative study of constitutional amendment processes, the United States stands at the top of his index of difficulty, exceeding the next highest scoring countries, Australia and Switzerland, by wide margins. According to the Senate, 11,848 attempts have been made to amend the US constitution. Only 27 have been successful and 10 of those were the Bill of Rights. We treat the constitution like a sacred cow in a way no other Western democracy does. Our reverence for a 250 year old piece of parchment, one that its own creators acknowledged was flawed and incomplete, has led to our downfall in many respects. George Washington wrote of the constitution, the warmest friends and best supporters the constitution has do not contend that it is free from imperfections, but found them unavoidable. The American people can, as they will have the advantage of experience on their side, decide with as much propriety on the alterations and amendments which are necessary as ourselves. I do not think we are more inspired, have more wisdom or possess more virtue than those who will come after us. And some argue our obsessive reverence of the constitution has led to the current problems we have in America, especially with regards to minority rule, where the actions of our politicians and courts do not match the beliefs and desires of the majority of Americans. A recent article from The Atlantic so succinctly summed up the dangers of our blind adherence to the constitution as this sacred document that I just wanna read this whole excerpt for you. Our excessively counter-majoritarian constitution is not just a historical curiosity, it is a source of minority rule. The constitution has always overrepresented sparsely populated territories favoring rural minorities, but because both major parties had urban and rural wings throughout most of American history, this rural bias had only limited partisan consequences. This changed in the 21st century. For the first time, one party, the Republicans, is based primarily in small towns and rural areas, while the other party, the Democrats, is based largely in urban areas. That means that our institutions now systematically privilege the Republicans. The Republican Party won the popular vote in only one presidential election from 1992 to 2020 
a span of nearly three decades. But thanks to the Electoral College, Republicans occupied the presidency for nearly half of that time. In the U.S. Senate, Republican senators not once represented a majority of Americans from 2000 to 2022, but they nevertheless controlled the Senate for half of this period. As often as not during the 21st century then, the party with fewer votes has controlled the Senate. In 2016, the Democrats won the national popular vote for the presidency and the Senate, but the Republicans nonetheless won control of both institutions. A president who lost the popular vote and senators who represented a minority of Americans then proceeded to fill three Supreme Court seats, giving the court a manufactured 6-3 conservative majority. This is minority rule. But the reality is that we are stuck with an incredibly difficult amendment process in a country that can't agree about much of anything. Calls have continued to introduce term limits in Congress, especially from Republicans, who are interested in showy legislative proposals that they can tout in their effort to drain the swamp, while knowing that they'd never actually be affected by them since they'll never be successful. Ted Cruz is one such slimy little guy. He introduced a bill that would amend the Constitution and cap senators at two six-year terms and House members at three two-year terms. In introducing the bill, he declared, the Founding Fathers envisioned a government of citizen legislators who would serve for a few years and return home, not a government run by a small group of special interests and lifelong permanently entrenched politicians who prey upon the brokenness of Washington to govern in a manner that is totally unaccountable to the American people. Cruz, whose bill would limit senators to two terms, is running for his third term next year. When asked why he was blatantly going against his own legislative proposals, he whined, I would happily comply with them if they applied to everyone. I never said I would do it alone if no one else complied. And so on and on we go, around the merry-go-round of politicians doing a song and dance about something they don't actually believe in so that they look good and say the right dog whistles to get their base out to the polls to re-elect them so they can continue the dog and pony show for another term, on and on until the sun finally explodes and relieves us from our misery. And so what will actually work? Well, I'm sorry to say it, but it seems the only way out of this is a constitutional amendment, but not the one you're thinking of, not the one put forth by Ted Cruz. We need to amend the constitution to get money out of politics. And I'm sure you're like, Legia, really? We're talking about money in politics again? Give it a rest. To which I say, yes, we are talking about money in politics again, because it always comes back to this. 72% of Americans favor limits on political spending, and overwhelming 85% of Americans agree with the statement, the cost of political campaigns makes it hard for good people to run for office. This includes identical shares of Republicans and Democrats. The overwhelming majority of Americans know that money is ruining our politics and allowing for the infiltration of private interests into our legislation, leading to greedy lawmakers who don't have to answer to their constituents because they know they'll get the funds they need to make re-election from the few special interests throwing the most cash at them. The idea of getting money out of politics is something that is incredibly popular, no matter your demographics, nationwide. Something so popular, I dare say that when put to the states for a vote, they would easily pass a constitutional amendment. This would remove issues with term limits that under undermine democratic voter preferences and mandatory retirement that promotes ageism and virtually all of the negative aspects that term limits and retirement ages present. Politicians could continue to serve for as long as their constituents wanted them to, but it would remove the incentive to maintain a death grip on long-held seats because there would no longer be any financial incentive to hold on as long as possible. More diverse, younger people would be able to run for office because it would remove the barrier that requires you to be a millionaire just to run for office because it's so fucking expensive. It would limit the influence of lobbyists and special interest groups over politicians because it would limit the amount of money that they could spend on influencing those politicians. This would lead to politicians who are more beholden to their constituents who elected them and not to big businesses who can afford to throw millions of dollars at lobbying firms. This would also reduce the amount of money private interests can throw at the Supreme Court nomination process. Conservative groups like the Federalist Society and the Judicial Crisis Network have thrown millions upon millions of dollars at getting pro-corporate justices on the bench, including spending at least $10 million on Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation alone. By getting money out of politics, we can improve our government's responsiveness to the actual people it's meant to serve. And there is a growing movement of people pushing for a constitutional amendment that would empower Congress to place limits on corporate spending and removes any ambiguity as to the fact that corporations are not people. Go to movetoamend.org to sign the petition and donate. Check out their Learn More tab and educate yourself. Go to opensecrets.org and look up your representatives. See where they've gotten money from. Then give them a call and ask them about their opinions 
experience on getting money out of politics. Share this video with your friends and check out my recent video about how money is ruining our democracy. And hey, if you didn't know, my work bringing you these videos week after week, which collectively take about 25 to 30 hours each to make, is supported in part through my Patreon, where I do weekly chats on our private Discord server, book giveaways, early access to videos, access to my research notes, and monthly Ask Me Anything style live streams just for Patreon supporters. If you like what you've been watching and any of that sounds good to you, I encourage you to come on over to Patreon today. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, including my newest patrons, and an extra special shout out to my multi-platinum patrons, Thomas Johnson, Sophia Sams, Anthony Giles, and Brett Piantek. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.